Welcome to our second talk in the webinar series of the section of evolutionary psychiatry of the World Psychiatric Association. I'm Riyad Abid, secretary of the section. I'm assisted by Adam Hunt from Zurich, who has organized the technical side and will keep an eye on the chat box. We are enormously privileged to have Professor Robin Dunbar speak at today's event. I'm sure that most of you who have tuned in will be familiar with Professor Dunbar's work, but for those few who aren't, here is an ultra short introduction. Robin Dunbar is professor at the University of Oxford. He is an evolutionary psychologist, evolutionary anthropologist, and primatologist. He's the author of over 400 scientific articles, author or editor of over 20 academic books, and author of another dozen popular science books. Many of the titles of his books have the term evolution in them, and even more have evolutionary content. He's widely known for his seminal work on the social brain, human encephalization, and of course, the famous Dunbar's number, of which we will hear more about today. Robin has been a supporter of the Evolutionary Psychiatry Special Interest Group at the Royal College of Psychiatrists from its very inception. He's, uh, he spoke at our first symposium in 2016 in London and has contributed a chapter to our Evolutionary Psychiatry edited volume due to appear later on this year. And by contributing to this webinar series, he has supported he has also supported the work of the World Psychiatric Association Evolutionary Psychiatry Section, and we're enormously grateful to him for that. His latest book, published in 2021, is titled Friends, Understanding the Power of Our Most Important Relationships. And that is also the title of his talk today. So over to you, Robin. Thank you very much, uh, Red. Um, I, I shall just share my screen here. Um, here we go. So thanks very much for the invitation to uh, talk. Um, uh, as you mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm a great enthusiast for uh, using evolution as a uh, framework for understanding human behavior. So it's wonderful to see um, evolutionary psychiatry appearing uh, as a force in its own right. Um, uh, but I, I hope I can add a little bit more in terms of the sort of background science a little bit today. Uh, probably not so much of it is going to be about evolution uh, as such, evolutionary processes, but what I'm talking about really is the outcome uh, of evolutionary processes that give rise to the way we behave and who we are and how we are. So I'm going to make three points in this lecture. Uh, one is that the human social world is actually very small scale, very small scale indeed. Um, that the constraints on our social world are partly cognitive, but also partly time. And thirdly, that social bonding is based on a dual process mechanism that's underpinned by the endorphin system with a little help from uh, some other neuroendocrines, particularly dopamine, but the endorphins are the important one. And this is working in tandem with what's essentially a cognitive or, and cognitive social process. So it's two separate uh, neural roots, essentially at work in the brain, but, but running in tandem to each other. Okay, so let me um, try and persuade you just as an opener. Um, how important uh, friendships are for you. And I think here's one of the surprises really of the last decade or so has been the sheer tsunami of, of epidemiological papers published showing that the single best predictor of your psychological health and well-being, your physical health and well-being, even your likelihood of surviving into the future, your longevity, uh, is best predicted by one factor and one factor alone, and that's um, uh, the number and quality of, of close friendships you have. And that everything else, all the things your uh, friendly neighborhood GP usually worries about on your behalf, uh, 
they're not insignificant, but they kind of fail, fade into, into the background uh, uh, compared with this single one effect. And here's one of those kind of compilations. This is a meta-analysis of 148 um, uh, uh, epidemiological studies, uh, principally focused on heart attacks. So the measure they're using, um, the outcome measure is the likelihood of surviving 12 months after your first heart attack. So I, I like the study because the outcome measure is really hard nosed. You can't argue about it. You either survive or you don't. And they, they're essentially looking to see what factors best predict that survival rate. And here are the effect sizes for the sort of most important ones. Uh, there are others that they looked at. Um, but you can see that um, network quality, which is a composite, they used two measures. One essentially was a quantitative measure of number of friends you had and the other was a qualitative one, the quality of those relationships. I've sort of combined them. Um, that and giving up smoking um, have much, much stronger effects on your ability to survive that first heart attack than anything else, including how much activity you take, um, how much of a, uh, um, a, a couch potato you are in effect, how much alcohol you consume, your BMI, and therefore your, your obesity, obesity, the drug treatments you're on, uh, the, the, the air you breathe, where you live, um, the diet you have, how many McDonald's uh, takeaways you, you have a week and all these kind of things. So this is this very strong effect simply from the social, social network, uh, small scale social network effects. And these have been picked up in the context of cancer patients, psychiatric patients, uh, psychological uh, conditions and so on. And interestingly enough, the last decade, we're beginning to see the same effects coming out of the primatological field work. So wild populations, baboons and chimpanzees, even wild horses and dolphins um, are showing similar effects that uh, the more friends you have, the higher the fertility you have, the longer you live, um, the quicker you recover from injury, um, the, the uh, more likely uh, your offspring are to, to make it through to adulthood and so on and so forth. These are massive, massive effects. Okay, so you might infer from this that the solution to uh, uh, life's problems uh, or longevity uh, um, and living forever is to simply have an infinite number of friends. And, and here's where the problem comes. You can't. Uh, Dunbar's number prevents you from doing so. Um, Dunbar's number was originally a prediction off the back of the uh, equation relating group size to the size of the neocortex in the primate brain. The neocortex is massive in primates. So in humans, the neocortex is 80% of your total brain volume. Um, but that prediction of 150, you can pick up all over the place. So here are just a few examples of that. Um, the, the main uh, graph there on the left is a very large uh, um, mobile phone, cell phone, uh, database uh, from one very large European country at 6 million subscribers to one provider, 6 billion calls over the course of a year. Here, taken out of that, are the number of, uh, essentially the number of people in the address box that the data have been processed to remove kind of um, uh, numbers that, that uh, look like um, uh, 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 um, online um, uh, places for, for buying stuff or, or, or your um, uh, uh, lawyer's uh, phone number or your baker's phone number or whatever. So this is, this is people that uh, you are phoning. And the distribution here um, reflects this very nicely. The, the mean is almost bang on 150. Some people don't have a very large number of uh, friends or very wide social circles. Others have a great deal. We know what some causes some of that variance. But the key point here is um, the, the, the average is almost exactly 150. And we pick up this same number in a number of different and sometimes quite weird contexts. So a big database on wedding sizes in the US dating back over uh, the last decade gives us an average wedding size of about 145. Um, if you look at hunter-gatherer clans, uh, communities, that's to say, um, in many parts of the world, um, uh, the average across them, it turns out to be about 155. The average company in all modern armies varies from about 120 up to about 200 across the major armies of the world. Um, the average is about 180 on the high side. Um, 
it, there's nice historical data starting with um, uh, the Doomsday Book uh, from 1087 AD, uh, where every English village, English and Welsh village, was censused a thousand years ago. And they've calculated the size of those villages. It's almost exactly bang on 150, the average village size. It is still the same average village size 700 years later at the end of the 18th century, uh, when we can determine it almost exactly from uh, parish birth and death and marriage re records. And there's some very nice data from the Italian Alps, looking at the size of grazing associations, effectively villages, um, over an 800 year period. And despite the fact that population is increasing dramatically through that time, up to the, the, the middle of the 19th century, um, the uh, size of grazing associations remains absolutely <laughs> obdurately stable at about 160 or so. So um, uh, we see these patterns absolutely everywhere once, once you know what to look for, as it were. That's not to say uh, that uh, humans don't live in other kinds of groupings, which can be bigger or smaller. I'll come back to that in a bit. But the reason this seems to work uh, in, in humans, so if you like, background primate data says that the size of a social group an animal lives in is determined by the size of its neocortex. Well, what we can show with humans is that this is actually true uh, for individuals. So there have been about a dozen neuroimaging studies now, which have looked at the correlates within the brain of um, uh, the number of friends you have measured in all sorts of different ways. Sometimes there's a sort of number of close friends you have, sometimes just simply the number of friends you have on Facebook. Always the picture is the same, that the, the number of friends you have, individual differences in, in friendship circle size, correlates with the, the volume of uh, two key um, uh, neural, interlinked neural networks. That's the mentalizing network, which runs essentially from the frontal lobe and the prefrontal cortex, or prefrontal cortex in particular, or the front end of the prefrontal cortex, back through to the temporoparietal junction, and then down along the, the um, uh, top surface, particularly of the temporal lobe to the temporal pole. Uh, and that's, that's the mentalizing cir cir the circuit that that, that's very active when you're thinking of trying to understand somebody else's mind state. And then in addition, it's turned out recently that the default mode network underneath that, which is running through from the orbital frontal cortex, up in the prefrontal cortex, down into the limbic system, the blue circle here with the dotted line, is also heavily involved. So this is a massive circuit with huge white matter tracks connecting it. And explains partly why perhaps uh, you get this correlation between group size and brain size. And we also now have data from macaques and baboons, uh, which show, so two old world monkeys, which show almost exactly the same results. The size of um, living groups uh, that the animals are in uh, correlates with the size of these same circuits. Um, so this clearly is a, a very general effect and it applies at the level of the individual. What's interesting about these in many ways, and particularly the fact it's locking into the frontal lobes and particularly the frontal pole. The frontal pole is unique to anthropoid primates and it allows them to do a number of things that other animals can't do. Let's say uh, engage in um, causal reasoning, uh, comparing two outcomes from two different behavioral strategies, um, a number of these kind of metacognitive things, but also crucially, it turns out inhibition, the ab ability to inhibit prepotent actions. So to think before you act rather than acting before you think, um, seems to depend on this. Uh, a, it's something that only anthropoid primates can do, monkeys and apes, and uh, the capacity to do that, the extent to which you can do that across species and across individuals, it seems, depends on the size of the frontal pole in particular. Um, so these seem to filter in, our, and, and we've come to the conclusion that probably the single most important cognitive uh, mechanism, we used to think it was mentalizing, and that's really actually quite important, but actually at least as important, if not more important, is the ability to inhibit actions, to step back from um, uh, going over the top, as it were, um, because what this is all about is keeping stable groups going through maintaining stable relationships and not kind of driving your friends away by, you know, sort of beating them up too often or stealing their uh, uh, um, food too often. 
Okay, so we have this grouping size of 150, but when you start to look at what actually happens in these grouping sizes, uh, these social networks of ours, um, the, they don't look like the picture on the left, which is, clearly comes from, from some summer concert somewhere, is not an anonymous thing. It, your, your social network looks much more like the picture on, on the lower right. It's very clumpy uh, and it consists of uh, quite discrete groupings within it. Um, and we've looked at this in a large number of different contexts, in fact. Um, uh, and, and I will show you the data here just uh, for um, our cell phone data set, our European cell phone data sets. And, and if you look at this statistically, what turns out is that most people, and so we're dealing with um, a, a, you know, tens of thousands of people's networks that, that we've extracted from their calling patterns. Um, if you look at the calling patterns, who they're calling, how often, you end up with what appear to be about four or five uh, quite distinct um, subsets or circles of, uh, of friendship. And the cir these circles differ in terms of the frequency of which you call them. Uh, we've done this on Facebook, looking at named postings. So you've even done it on Twitter, which is a bit worrying. So these are the Twitterati uh, talking to, to each other, um, uh, posting to each other um, in discussion about within somebody's Twitter account. Here are cell phone data. We've looked at it in other contexts, uh, which are much more structural. We get exactly the same pattern. And we have our own data on the frequency of face-to-face -face interactions. So these are the mean layer sizes of, uh, that come out of the, the statistical analysis of, of the network structure. And what seems to happen is you get a layer at somewhere around about one to two, a layer at somewhere about five, a layer at somewhere about 15-ish, and a layer at somewhere about 50-ish. And then there are further layers out beyond that, but, but these are the core layers that we get. And it turns out that these layers, you can see how across these different media, these layers are extremely consistent. What's interesting is these, these layers reappear in the structure of organizations, particularly the not so much the one and a half, perhaps, which really has to do with very intimate romantic relationships. But the other layers beyond that uh, appear all over the place in um, uh, uh, the way human groups are organized, human communities are organized, human organizations are organized, and also in the way primate groups are organized. So if you look at the distribution of grouping sizes across the 250 to 300 species of primates, what comes out is the same grouping sizes. There are species that typically have a group size of about two, two and a half, uh, species that have a group size of about five, species that have a group size of about 15, to 16 species that have a group size of around about 50. There's nothing after that in primates. No primate has a group size this big. So what, what essentially this means is your social world really consists of a series of layers, a bit like the ripples on a pond when a stone is thrown in. So you're at the center, you have these layers, these layers are inclusive. So the layer of 15 includes the five within it. It's not an extra 15 people, it's an extra 10 people. Um, these layers differ very distinctively in terms of both the frequency of contact and the emotional closeness. So if you, if you ask people to rate the specific individuals in their circles, you'll see this distinct pattern emerging in terms of the emotional closeness of their relationships. These layers then have a, this very distinct scaling ratio of about three. Each layer is three times the size of the layer inside it, roughly. Uh, these numbers the sort of um, are, are the kind of um, uh, nominal numbers that we've we've given to these layers they're not exactly what we see and of course there is a lot of variation around that this this is just population averages but you can see the red line at 150 that demarcates our substantive social world these are the people you have meaningful relationships with relationships that have history and they're very distinctive in the sense that you will help people in these layers out um, uh, if they ask you, you won't think about it. But out beyond that 150, beyond the red line, if somebody asks you to do them a favor, um, you do, you much more like to weigh it up and, and, and ask for payment uh, up front or at least a promise of repayment in the future. But we can detect these two further layers out there, one at 500, one at 1500, 
uh, one at 500, we well here, here are the names we attach to these layers, effectively in terms of friendship guys. A layer of 500 is really acquaintances. Uh, essentially, a lot of the people we work with would be there. Um, you know them quite well. You'll have a, go out and have a beer with them, a meal with them, but you wouldn't invite them home to your house, almost certainly not. The people in 150 are what I sometimes call your kind of um, uh, wedding, bar mitzvah and, and funeral uh, and network. They'll, they will turn up on those once in a lifetime big occasions uh, to celebrate with you. In this case, people in the acquaintances layers will not. The 1500 layer seems to correspond to um, people whose faces we can put names to. And then we now know that the layer that go, runs out to about 5,000, so it's maintaining the sequence. Um, and that appears to be the number of faces. That, and that was figured out by some psychophysicists, uh, vision physicists, not by us. Uh, and they didn't realize they were doing it. When I found the paper, I went, oh, perfect. Um, uh, it's the number of faces you can tell whether they, you've seen them before or not. So you can distinguish between strangers and people you, you, you know. Um, that inner layer of five are what we call the shoulders to cry on friends. They, that seems to be the critical one for maintain, giving us these uh, uh, physical and psychological health and well-being uh, benefits. The other layers seem to correspond to different kinds of benefits that are, if you like, more diffuse and more social rather than, than personal. But you, we can attach specific kinds of benefits to some of these layers. So that's what your social world looked like. Interestingly, if any of you have been in the military, you are looking at the structure of military units, all modern armies since for the last 300, 200 years, certainly 200 years, had this structure, uh, sections of, of five, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, specialist groups of five, let's say uh, special boat service and special air service uh, uh, operating units uh, of five in the British Army, or four to five, Green Berets and, and Navy SEALs, the same in America, uh, a section of five, um, a platoon of round about up, up to about 50, um, uh, a company of 150, a uh, battalion of 500, a regiment of 1500, the division of 5000 and so on. They keep that ratio of three going uh, beyond that even. So anyway, how do we keep our, the, or how do we build these relationships and keep them going? Because the secret of primate sociality is the maintenance of stable social groups over time. The primates are very unusual in this respect in that they have very, relatively speaking, very large, very stable social groups. So uh, animals can uh, be born into a group and die in a, in a group usually. And not everybody does that because very often uh, one sex will leave to go to another group for, to, to find mates. But once you're embedded within a group, um, you tend to stay there. And particularly in the kind of um, more socially, socially evolved uh, species of monkeys and apes, the females tend to, to uh, stay in the groups they were born in, and it's the males that move. But the groups then have a very stable core, uh, and they're aside, you know, other than the usual birth and death um, uh, processes, they, they, they remain very stable uh, over long periods of time. And the, the problem for them is how to keep that stability going. Going, how to keep those relationships going. Most other species will form herds which come and go but have no, uh, in no intense relationships between individual animals that, that hold the thing together as a whole. The way primates seem to do this, and it's particularly the anthropoid primates, the monkeys and apes, but especially so the old world monkeys and apes, um, is as I mentioned earlier, this dual process mechanism uh, and it, it's based around this activity uh, uh, you can see on the screen, grooming, uh, which they spend an inordinate amount of time uh, doing. And, and some of these very, very social species, particularly the gelada baboon at the top, who live in very large groups, uh, they devote about a fifth, 20% of their entire day to grooming. This is far, far more than they need for, for pure hygiene. Um, what grooming does is trigger a in very intense emotional experience that is actually underpinned by uh, the endorphin system in the brain. And what that does is kind of provide a psychopharmacological platform uh, of which they can then build a cognitive relationship. And this is essentially a relationship of trust, of obligation and reciprocity. Um, and that depends both on these more sophisticated forms of cognition that we find in primates that in turn reflect their very big, uh, relatively very big brains. 
Um, just to show you, and we know that in primates, grooming uh, triggers the endorphin system and is heavily involved in, in relationships. Here's some evidence now from uh, one of our studies carried out by my collaborators in Finland, um, uh, looking at the same effect in humans. So what they did was put a bunch of people, you have to do this by PET scanning, so it's pretty miserable stuff for the poor participants uh, um, uh, or volunteers. Um, but uh, uh, um, a lot of them do it, uh, thankfully. Um, but what they did is they stuck a lot of uh, people in uh, PET scanners and they had their partner um, stroke them very gently on the um, torso and so give them very strict instructions. Um, we, for tactical reasons, decided to put the men in the scanners and the uh, girlfriends or wives, in the case may be, uh, to do the stroking because we thought that since males are generally much less social and emotionally social, let's just say, uh, than women, if we could show it in men, we could show it in anybody. And here's their brains or composite picture of their brains firing up um, in response to being stroked. So this is, this is the endorphin receptors all over the brain just going wild absorbing the endorphins that are being pumped out as a result of stroking. You'll notice in the middle brain there on the left hand side the occipital lobe um, uh, is completely empty, uh, nothing's going on. Of course, that's almost entirely taken up with visual processing, so it's hardly surprising. But the emotional control and management of uh, the mental states of, of yourself and other people that goes on, particularly up on the frontal lobe, um, prefrontal cortex, and especially the orbital frontal cortex uh, on the right-hand side, you can see just how massive the firing is that's, that's going on there. And uh, of course, we don't have all that much hair left uh, for our um, friends and relations to go grooming us with. So what we've done is substitute essentially stroking and hugging and caressing and so on, which produces the same thing. Because the way this works uh, is through a rather uh, nice little system, which again, we've only known about for about a decade or so, um, the afferency tactile neur neural system. Um, now, the afferency tactile um, CT system is distributed all over the skin. It, it's sort of basically at the base of every hair follicle, uh, there's a receptor for it. And in a number of other places, which we were surprised to discover subsequently. Um, but the, the nerves that run from the receptors in the skin uh, through to the brain are very, very different from those for the, the rest of the uh, peripheral um, nerve system, and so on. Um, uh, the, the conventional uh, peripheral nerves are, are, are myelinated, so they're very fast. They go straight into the uh, brain, to the somatosensory cortex, and then they loop back out again uh, via the motor cortex uh, to send us return signals. So the return loop goes back to the peripheral skin, um, which is the bit that instructs you to pull your hand away when, 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 when you've stuck it in the fire, as it were, and the brain's realised it's a bit hot. In contrast, the um, C-tactile system, uh, neurons are unmyelinated, so they're extremely slow. Uh, they are one-directional. There's no return motor loop at all. They simply go from the, the receptors into the brain, and they go to the insular cortex, which is involved in the orphan system quite heavily. But from there, they, they seem to trigger the endorphin system. At slow stroking, about three centimeters per second. The speed is very specific. A lower speed than three centimeters per second or a faster speed, the system doesn't respond at all. It only responds at the, what is actually turns out to be the speed of hand movements across the skin when you're, you're grooming. And it seems to be the deformation of the skin that occur, occurs during grooming and during stroking and so on, that actually sets these neurons off and triggers the endorphin system. Uh, just to give you a sense of how, well, I probably don't need to take, tell this audience how important these things are in life, but here's uh, a composite from, from um, uh, a number of our studies we've done on where people are allowed to touch each other. Um, uh, so these are, these are surveys uh, uh, from, from Finland, Russia, Britain, France, Italy, and Japan, asking people, think of a specific person. It may be your partner, it may be your best friend, it may be a parent, 
It may be a cousin, think of a specific cousin. It may be an acquaintance. It may be a stranger. Where are you happy for them to touch you on your body? Or where do you feel comfortable about touching them on their body? And the lighter, the uh, more yellow the color, the lighter the color, um, the happier you are uh, for that area to be touched. The darker the color, particularly the black, the less happy you are. And you can see uh, the, 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 the um, outlines, body outlines are ordered in terms of closeness, of, of uh, emotional closeness of the relationship. And you can see that uh, your closer relationships, you're pretty much happy for, for a lot of um, uh, physical contact with them. But once you get out beyond about cousins, um, and particularly out to strangers, it's, it's very limited indeed. And with strangers, it's pretty much limited to handshakes, really, sort of offering them a token physical contact that's as quite removed as almost as far as possible uh, from the rest of your body. Um, and these, these effects are pretty much the same all over Europe. Uh, you know, we don't find a big difference between, uh, or the different, let's say the differences between the sort of uptight um, non-tactile British and the uh, hugely tactile and effusive Italians is really quite small. It's quite modest indeed. In fact, actually the Finns turned out to be the most touchy-feely um, uh, population in Europe, surprisingly. But the same patterns that there in Japan, uh, you know, it, it, it seems to be pretty much uh, rise above cultural differences, as it were. So it, that that's sort of pretty important, in t we think, in terms of the amount of physical uh, stimulation of, of the endorphin system that goes on. Interestingly, the limit seems to be out about cousins, which would take you out to this 50 layer, which is the upper limit of grooming that you find in primates. Um, there's been a lot of uh, excitement over the, the, the years about a variety of um, neuropeptides and neuroendocrines in the brain as being sort of the, the, the magic mystery tour of uh, for, for the social world as it were oxytocin being perhaps the most overworked one of these um so obvious question is well you know what's oxytocin doing in there it's what everybody believes to be the magic social hormone uh, the trust hormone etc 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 why am i focusing on beta endorphins in particular uh, for the endorphin in particular well it struck us uh, very early on that one of the problems with a lot of this um, research on on social um, neuroendocrines is that nobody ever controls for the other one so there's a huge amount of work on oxytocin which involves hugging <laughs> and other kinds of physical contact you think well it you know all you may be doing is triggering the endorphin system but you're assuming that it's doing something in the oxytocin system um, but secondly, what really did frustrate us, I think more than anything else, was the fact that the, what was regarded as being social, the social world that we're, we're looking at, was very, very narrow-minded. It, it was focused on dyadic relationships, you and your best friend or you and your magic partner. Yet one can recognize three completely different um, uh, domains, if you like, of the social world in terms of the disposition to be, social, uh, the, the close dyadic relationship, so you have romantic relationships, but then these are embedded in this wider social network of, the, of your little local network or community. Uh, so we actually run a, a very large scale genetic study um, uh, with about a thousand people who had their DNA um, uh, assayed for the um, genes for the in, uh, receptors of these six major uh, social neuro uh, uh, endocrines and peptides uh, using a number of different scales and the, and the picture that comes out of this um, uh, looks like look, something like this so yes oxytocin does appear in the context of dyadic relationships that's that's sort of quite a strong effect although I hate to say the effect is whitewashed quite heavily if you control for endorphins uh, in the in the same analysis so it looks like yeah, whatever oxytocin is doing, endorphins are actually involved heavily too in, in dyadic relationships. But the key thing perhaps is, is these effects that beta endorphin and dopamine, which is often run, works in tandem with, with the endorphin system, have in terms of running the whole system. There's some suggestion perhaps that the endorphins are very uh, much stronger in kind of social disposition uh, 
uh, uh, and perhaps dyadic relationships and the dopamine system running to, 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 to network sizes. Um, but this is sort of part and parcel of the reason we, we really uh, are interested in endorphin system. The other reason for thinking the endorphin system might be more important is the half-life of oxytocin is absolutely dreadful. You, you measure it in minutes, whereas the half-life of endorphins is measured in, in getting close to hours. Um, so it lasts a long time. And the key thing about uh, endorphins is oxytocin seems to work in terms of you either have the right gene or you have don't, in which case your pro-sociality, as it were, your attitude, the way you behave to others is accordingly dictated. What's important about the endorphin system is you can trigger that kind of behavior in other people. You can manipulate their endorphin system by con uh, stroking them and all these kinds of other things we do to trigger the endorphin system and make them behave much more nicely towards you or feel much more bonded. Um, uh, looking at the time, I'm going to skip over that it's just a bit more uh, uh, neuroanatomy. Um, just a, 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 some more of our uh, PET scanning um, uh, uh, neuroimaging data showing that um, the endorphin receptor densities, particularly up in the orbital frontal cortex, correlate very highly with your um, uh, uh, um, attachment style, the classic psychological attachment style, particularly so on the, the avoidance uh, uh, dimension of that. Um, <clears throat> but let me go back to the social side of this now, which is really to ask who makes a good friend, how do we make friends? And in, in, in the parlance of um, uh, estate agents or realtors, as the Americans would call them, it's homophily, homophily, homophily. Everything comes down to homophily, and it comes in two different forms. One is endogenous traits, and the other is exogenous traits. So your friends tend to resemble you in very, very striking ways. Um, the endogenous traits really, well, as far as we know at the moment, anyway, the ones we, we have evidence for, boil down to a very, very strong gender bias, uh, a strong ethnicity, uh, effect and, a, and again a strong personality effect but the, the gender bias is much stronger than the others. Um, these are data from one of our samples of women's social networks. Um, women's social networks, 75% of uh, women's social networks consist of other women and only 25% of the, the, or well, the other 25% are, are males obviously. Um, and we see exactly the same pattern but in reverse for men. Uh, and that 25% of opposite sex tends to be uh, family members rather than, than friends as such. And this proportion remains absolutely stable across the age range from uh, the age of five up to the age of 85. It barely budges uh, an inch. Um, um, so there's these very strong effects. The, 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 these we think, particularly the ethnicity effect, we think are actually distance cues. So you're using them initially, um, they don't necessarily draw, determine your relationships once you get to know people better. Um, the other side of it, the, the, the um, uh, exogenous component is what we take into calling the seven pillars of friendship. These are kind of like a supermarket barcode you, you have which defines who you are and it kind of defines the community you belong to because essentially it, it harks back to how and where you were socialized as much as anything else. But it, because these are cultural, they change through the lifetime and uh, uh, as you, you move from one kind of community to another. But they seem to be very robust. Uh, they're all equally valued. There is you know, a, a three, three um, dimension, a three pillar friendship uh, uh, that can be any, combination, any combination of three of those seven, seven dimensions doesn't seem to matter. And the seven dimensions are having the same language or better still dialect, uh, coming from the same place, which I think is much more about growing up in the same place. So you know the kinds of ways of the people as it were, um, uh, uh, they're more familiar to you. Having the same educational trajectory, and this is sort of just a reflection, I think, of the fact that most of um, the medical profession's uh, friends are also medics. Most of lawyers' friends are lawyers. And um, this tendency to cluster together, simply because you have things in common to talk about that are of common interest. Uh, and that's reflected in the fourth dimension, which is having the same hobbies and interests, having the same worldview, which is a composite of moral, political, and religious views. And then the two interesting ones, having the same musical taste and the same sense of humor. These are very, very strong effects. These. Uh, so the, the 
the data in the graph simply show from a, uh, one of our studies the rated level of emotional closeness to randomly produced people's profiles. So we, we constructed profiles, as it were, of, um, oh, I beg your pardon, it's another study. What this is, is the actual profiles of named people within the person's um, social network. So we said, think of uh, a, a brother or think of a sister, think of a male friend, a female friend, and rate them on these things and rate yourself. And basically what, what, what these data show is the more of these seven dimensions that are common to those relationships, the more the higher the emotional closeness is, and indeed the more willing you are to be out towards that person, the, the longer the relationship is likely to last. So why is time important in all this? And it has to do with the fact that these friendship relationships in particular are very susceptible to decay if we don't keep reinforcing them. This is likewise the problem with humans. These are data from one of our studies showing the rate of contact per day, per individual, in each of the layers of the social network running out to the 500 layer. And you can see how we devote a huge amount of our time to the five people in that inner core shoulders to cry network. In fact, they, they account for 40% of our total social effort and our emotional capital that we invest in them as well. It doesn't matter how you measure it. Uh, and another 20% is devoted to the 10 other people in the 15 layer. So between them, uh, these people who are closest to us emotionally uh, get 60% of our total social effort uh, measured in terms of time, literally. And these people out here in, say, the 150 layer are getting something in the order of 30 seconds a day each, which is sort of pretty trivial. After moving away from home, um, they're, they're rating the emotional closeness, and what's plotted here is the change in emotional closeness, so this is no change here, um, uh, at month zero when the study started through months nine and months 18 for the whole of their extended families so it's the average across their entire extended family or their friends the original friends at, at time zero and you can see the extended family so that then they're not physically able to contact them your 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 emotional closeness actually seems to go up and absence really does make the heart grow fonder but for friends that's not true friends just quietly or the relationship decays and they gradually drift down through the layers eventually two to three years of not actually seeing anybody. Um, the, um, uh, uh, there's a very striking sex difference, and this is one of the things that came out of a lot of this work, is how different the social world of men and women actually is. Um, but just to reflect one aspect of that, um, this is that same uh, uh, group of people moving away from home. So it's asking them about the change in emotional closeness uh, again, here's zero and zero up there. Um, for the relationship, six months, uh, sorry, nine months later after they'd moved away, as a function of whether they had engaged in more or less of particular activities. So here on the right hand side is contacting them by phone or contacting them in person. Here is doing stuff with them. So um, you know, arranging to go shopping or arranging to go to a party or arranging to go on holiday. There's a long list of things they were asked to do. Um, if we look at the, the, the males and females, and these are young adults, uh, 18 to 20 year olds, you, you, can, you can see two, well, one very depressing thing and one very interesting thing is uh, what keeps girls' friendships going and maintained over time when they can't, uh, easily meet up is just talking together, right? So the phone, texting, Facebook, these all these things allow them to keep uh, servicing and maintaining the friendship, keep it going. Um, conversation apparently has no effect at all, zero effect on boys' uh, 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 friendships. Um, it's quite extraordinary. What, what makes the difference to them is doing stuff together. Now, doing stuff together makes some difference to the girls, of course, but it's a very much stronger effect in the case of, uh, of the, 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 the men. Um, and, and this appears to be this big difference, that women's networks are built up and maintained through conversations, conversation, whereas with boys, I suppose not to put too fine a thing on it, 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 it's about banging heads together. Banging heads together might be, is, it, you know, is, is kind of engaging in activity. It might be the five-a-side football uh, uh, every Friday night. It might be the uh, friends you, the, you go climbing mountains with. 
um, at, at weekends, it might be just the guys you go having a drink with. It, it's much more club-like as a result, and it's much less personalized and individual. Uh, for the girls' relationships, they really are personalized on who the person is. For the boys, it's belonging to a club, and it doesn't matter who you are, as long as you can fulfill the criteria of the club. And that criteria may be as simple as being able to lift a beer uh, pint glass and, uh, from the table to your mouth. That's the kind of activity. So clearly, conversations go on in that context, but the kind of conversations go on are very different. Okay. Um, the, the last thing I just want to sort of highlight then is in the context of grooming. Grooming, um, as I said, is very limiting. It's very limiting because it's very intimate, this physical contact of skin-to-skin uh, of -skin contact. So we don't do it with everybody, um, clearly. In fact, it can be quite aversive if it's with a stranger, somebody you don't know. So it's very intimate, very personalized. Um, but it, it means that the amount of endorphin triggering that has to be done hits a limit and therefore limits group size. And in the course of human evolution, which is all this graph on the left-hand side shows, is somehow uh, this upper limit at 20% uh, of the day spent grooming that you see in primates, modern humans through the course of their evolution had to find other ways of triggering the endorphin system with more people. And the, the only way you can do that really is to step back from grooming uh, and touch-based activities uh, uh, so you can have a bigger grooming group that isn't inv involving this intimacy. And the way we seem to have done that is to find a lot of other behaviors which trigger the endorphin system extremely well. And, and these are the main ones. So laughter, which we share with the great apes uh, and is, is clearly very ancient. Singing and dancing, singing uh, without words. This, this, this is so chorusing, if you like, um, which of course lots of musical traditions still do. Um, uh, and then finally, after the evolution of language, uh, uh, the rituals of religion, feasting, eating and drinking, and finally emotional storytelling in particular, but generic storytelling. All of these turn out, and um, we've shown either with neuroimaging or, 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 or other, other ways to trigger the endorphin system, they all increase the sense of belonging and, and bonding. And they probably came in at, at, at three different stages sometime over there. Just to give you a sense of that, uh, these are a composite of a series of experiments we did with laughter, um, simply showing a, uh, well, we're using a pain um, threshold test, uh, uh, a pain uh, tolerance test uh, as our measure of endorphin um, uh, activation. So pain thresholds should, should rise uh, after an activity if endorphins have been activated and, and not rise, um, uh, maybe even decline. If endorphins haven't been activated, we show people a, uh, comedy video, something like a Mac Michael McIntyre uh, CD, uh, one of his stand-up shows, and then we have a control group, which will be something innocuous like um, golfing instruction video. The main important thing is they don't don't laugh at that. So they laugh at the comedy video. They don't laugh at the um, uh, <clears throat> uh, neutral video. And here are the results of these. Um, the here's zero, no change in pain threshold. This is a negative change. Pain thresholds are lower after um, at the end of the experiment and above the line, um, the change is positive, and your pain threshold goes up. And you can see that all these comedy experimental conditions lie above the um, uh, control groups, the, the non laughter control groups. Um, and we've replicated this in uh, our, our neuroimaging studies. Um, and here's um, the brain firing up again. You can see it's exactly the same areas. Uh, the receptors for the endorphins in the, across the brain just absorbing um, the endorphins being produced as a result of laughing. Um, so just to sum up, uh, Dunbar's number, well, Dun uh, social, human social world is very small. It's Dunbar's number, about 150 people. It varies from about, well, 100 perhaps up to about 250 across individuals, but the average is very much uh, across populations 150. Uh, it, that size is determined essentially by the size of our neocortex as much as anything, particularly the front, more frontal end of, of, of the neocortex. Um, our social networks are highly structured and highly homophilous, which is one reason why we get echo chamber effects. Uh, the structure of these networks is determined mainly by how we allocate time to maximize the benefits that are gained from different qualities of relationships. 
And at the end of the day, friendships really are underpinned by um, this dual process mechanism that involves a bit of hard wiring in terms of um, uh, uh, the um, uh, neuropharmacology of the endorphin system in particular, um, but also the kind of soft end, if you like, of course that's also hardwired in the brain, but it's much more culturally influenced and, uh, that involves this kind of social cognition, this ability to understand, get inside the minds of other people, but also exploiting through that this seven pillars of friendship effect, which allow you to kind of build up very quickly a relationship with somebody without having to spend a lot of time uh, with them. In other words, just knowing what they, where they lie on the seven pillars tells you whether they'll make a good friend for you or not. So on that um, happy note, um, I shall go back and uh, stop sharing. And um, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Robin. Um, really um, concise summary of um, um, quite a few aspects of your book from Henry O'Connell. Thank you for a wonderful overview regarding social networks. What about the issue of cause and effect? This is about the health issues, of course. Ah, <laughs> okay. Uh, that's a very good question. And, and um, uh, of course, there, there are perennial problems uh, trying to unpack a lot of this, the causality involved in this, particularly with, with the evolutionary things, because you're looking at the path. I think the health, uh, effects of well I, I i will um retreat to the defense which is generally known as blame the other person and say that all these health effects are uh, uh, uh um uh, they're basically correlational studies i think in the end um uh, in the sense that they're epidemiological studies uh, that uh, have been done one can tease uh, uh causal structures out of that with statistically using things like path analysis. I'm not sure whether that's actually ever been done. Most, most of these have, uh, have been fairly just straightforward um, causal effects. But I, I think buried in there, since a lot of these are longitudinal studies, uh, sometimes half lifetime, I mean, they really are very long, long, um, these enormous national databases, medical databases. Um, I think it's very hard to get away from uh, the conclusion that the, these effects or that they're picking up are directly causal because you can see them going on. Um, <clears throat> I mean, we can pick up some other, in, in other areas. I have to say in, in the kind of physical health end, people have done experiments with uh, things like responses of the immune system to flu injections, for example, or, or those kind of interventions. Uh, and shown that people who have larger social circles um, uh, as uh, producing uh, fewer uh, immune system responses to challenges that, that that are being that they're being put under sort of inflammatory type challenges so that they, they their whole immune system seems to be coping much better with those kinds of challenges so I think the the kind of there is a sort of a hovering in the background, um, a, quite a reasonable experimental um, uh, literature, but it's focused entirely on those kind of small scale things. The, the larger scale things, um, I guess, we will never get an experiment from because you don't want, you don't want to sort of uh, partition, partition your uh, world into two groups of people, some of whom have no friends and some of whom have five, and then wait to see how early they die. <laughs> You'd not be getting that through an ethics committee. <laughs> oh, you're muted. Yeah, Brandy, would you like to ask a question? Yeah. Yes, very wonderful, Rob, and it's fabulous to see how this is all Hello, continuing Andy. to develop. What are you doing? All of these years. <laughs> right. You know, um, we, we gave a, a series of talks together for the WPA several years ago in South America. But yep. I've got a very specific question, Robin. Yep. In your data, do you find any sudden uh, disjunction between communal relationships and instrumental relationships, this distinction that social psychologists have made so much of? Um, uh, do you want to elaborate, um, obviously, for the benefit of the audience rather than me, what the difference between communal and instrumental <laughs> 
<laughs> um, and you have an instrumental relationship with your baker and your auto mechanic. Okay, fine. Um, and, and a communal relationship. You don't expect to get back yes. all of your investments. It's, a, it's an yes. emotional, loving okay. commitment. Yes. Uh, I mean, I think that, that we are really concerned with those kind of communal relationships here, that, that by and large, uh, those kind of instrumental relationships are ones that you have with people in your 500 layer and beyond. Right, that's what sort of defines the quality of those relationships. And they're basically trading relations. I suppose a lot of what we've done has been triggered by irritation at a view of the social world in a lot of the science, even the psychological uh, science uh, in this area, that, that's been driven by an economist view. <laughs> Life is about trading. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I do a favor for you and you do a favor for me. And, and it seemed to us this completely missed the point of primate sociality and they're actually protection from environmental um, uh, 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 insults, as, as you might say. So things like protection from predation and things. Um, they're not uh, uh, um, uh, prisoner's dilemma type um, uh, problems. So there is, you know, you, you don't get this situation you get with a lot of these economic games where people start behaving very generously to each other and then gradually cease to behave generously um, because they suddenly realize actually they can get more money by not putting into the uh, doing favors to people or putting money into the common pool um, and, and cheating on the system. The, the, these, you, they, these kind of group defense effects, this is not group selection, I hasten to add, um, but it, it's what's now known as group level uh, effect selection. Um, you have no, you, you, you know, you are either in the system or you're not. It, it's not a matter of putting money and everybody's sharing the cost. Equally. So to do that, the, what seems to happen with primates is this, this building of these very intense uh, relationships, which make you committed to the other individual. You're not going to abandon them the first time a predator turns up, you'll, you'll, you'll sort of look out for their interests. And of course it causes them, if you look at the behavior of these kinds of species, they're constantly checking on each other to make sure they don't lose sight of each other um, uh, much as we do, might do uh, uh, in, in a social context with our, our, our close relationships. And so I, I think that social world is very, very different. I mean, uh, to the kind of instrumental world you referred to, which is, the economist view of the world. The world is about trading relationships. Thank you very much, Robin. Um, with a, a chat a question, um, it's from Miriam Razmadza, um, and uh, uh, it says, thank you for an interesting talk. Can you specify if there's any difference between childhood friends and friends acquired later in life uh, regarding differences, girls and boys, and talking club-like friendships, thanks. Okay, yes, I, I mean, there is a big, I mean, I, I showed you some evidence that um, relationships decay naturally with time if you don't reinforce them. Um, that's the general <clears throat> hidden behind that um, is a very small group of people in your social network who can be very persistent. Well, actually, it's not so small because you might have noticed it in one of the graphs, this distinction between family and friends. So what we find in, 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 uh, certainly in our European or Euro-American data, let's say, um, very consistently is, is, is family and friends are treated very differently. And those kind, kind of relationships behave very differently. In other words, family don't need so much investment. Fam the, the fact that you are a member of the family holds you in place because a family is a very densely interconnected network. So, and there are people who make sure you know how Auntie Jemima is getting on and uh, how uh, Uncle Pete's new grandson is, is doing and all these kinds of information flow through the network. It keeps you looped into the system. And that seems not in general to happen with friends. Friendship networks are very small and your friendship half of your network tends to consist of a lot of small subgroups who never interact, whereas the family network is one large component. Uh, in in small-scale traditional societies, all your network, 150 people, would be related to you. They're all family, extended family and in-laws in, in some way. Um, in kind of 
the modern industrial uh, domain, um, it, we find, at least in, in our British and, and European samples, that the family and friends split is 50 50. Um, and everybody else kind of lies somewhere in between, I guess. But over a period in that European uh, cell phone data set, and we find that only 10% of people move out of or into that inner, inner layer in a three year period. So the rate of turnover is very low, whereas the rate of turnover beyond that's very high. In our uh, 18 to 20 year old sample, 40% of friends change position in the course of a year, a very, very high turnover. Now that inner circle of five typically consists of two close family members, they're going to be stable anyway, and two friends. So there, those are very special relationships and they are very, very stable, but they are exceptional and they're particularly exceptional. Uh, the, the big difference between men and women is we picked up in, in Facebook profile pictures. If you look at profile pictures, um, aside and ignore all the things like motorbikes and, 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 and uh, sneakers, which appear as profile pictures, astonishingly, um, uh, in very large numbers, um, what you tend to find is if there's only two people in it, it's probably a female um, uh, person's uh, Facebook page and the likelihood is if it's the same age person it will either be uh, a boyfriend or a best a female best friend a best friend forever that 50 50 split if you look at boys French uh, profile pictures they will tend increasingly to have groups in them and certainly and typically they, they will be as high as four people there would be four blokes sitting on the top of a mountain and four blokes crowding into a, 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 um, a soccer uh, five-a-side goal or, a, or an ice hockey goal or something like that or, or four four blokes sitting around a table uh, 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 with with beer glasses on the thing that, that kind of thing they have this sort of clubby relationship and it, it leads to this much less intense kind of friendship so the, what tends to seems to happen then is you know if if, if friends move apart uh girls and women will be on facebook and and email and, and and maybe phones trying to keep the relationship going with that particular friend if it's particularly if it's that best friend forever whereas with boys because their friendships are much more casual somehow um, they were kind of, well, you know, too bad, um, you know, Jim's moved away. Well, Pete will do. <laughs> we'll just slot him into Jim's position in the, in the network. I mean, that, we actually do. We have, we have a signature, a very clear s signature, which is rather like a fingerprint, social fingerprint, in our, the way we distribute our um, social time to the friends in our network, friends and family in our network. And that is extremely robust over time. It doesn't change. And when we chuck somebody out in the same slot that's being vacated, it's, it's a remarkable thing. It's just like a social fingerprint. Really. So, you know, the kind of um, expectation of it, but uh, this, we've been very, very struck by the difference intimate level in the sort of social worlds that the two sexes really um, Well, we're, we have a lot more questions, but I'm very conscious of the time. But, uh, and, and we had many, many thank yous and uh, a lot of appreciation. Um, but we can't let you go before asking you a uh, pandemic relation, uh, a, a pandemic related question. Um, you know, with all the lockdowns that have occurred and, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and the social isolation and the loneliness, what do you predict? What kind of health problems do you, whether it's psychological or uh, or physical, do you predict with this with this um, unprecedented social yes. experiment that has yes. taken place? Yes. Well, it is the second experiment, remember, because we did it once a hundred years ago, so uh, and everybody's forgotten what the results were, and I think they've forgotten what the results were is be because simply because there were no consequences in the long run. That kind of in the broad picture, you know, we are so driven to be social. Uh, you know, as soon as we've been let out of school again, we're just going to go back as fast as we can to renew our relationships. They will have changed. There will be changes because you, you will sort of kind of reevaluate your, your particular relationships 
uh, and uh, uh, you know somebody who hasn't contacted you, you kind of might go, well, maybe I might call them up and go go for a meal with them again. But we'll wait and see what they do. Um, so I think there will be churn and turnover, but basically things will be fine, except for possibly two groups. One is uh, post sixty five, because what you find in social networks is <clears throat> post sixty five. It, it well, if you look at people's networks across the lifespan. And this has kind of been done cross-sectionally, uh, but the pattern is very clear. Uh, it starts small, it increases through childhood and teenagehood, reaches a sort of plateau in, in the sort of mid-20s uh, at around 150, stabilizes through to about um, 60, 65, and then starts inexorably to decline. What happened is people are losing the outer circle. And one of the knock-on consequences of that inevitably is higher uh, psychological and, and physical ill health. Now, if people have been locked up uh, or locked down for a year or two, as effectively we have been, for old people, that's already going to start to exacerbate what is what is already a serious decline, particularly or in the kind of late teenagers, because I think the late teenagers are so driven to be social, they will just want to get out there <laughs> and catch up. But it might have an effect earlier in, in life with younger kids because um, what's clearly very important, we see this both in primates and we see it in developmental psychology. In other words, it's all very well having a big computer brain, but you've got to put some software in it. This, it, it, only, it only comes uh, with, written in with, with an operating system, basically. What, what that, putting the software in effectively is what you do through childhood and into um, the teenage years where you learn and practice and experience different contexts and learn how to handle this incredibly complex adult world. And this goes in parallel with what we now understand with brain development, that it doesn't really settle down, brain doesn't really settle down to mid-20s. And we've shown with neuroimaging experiments that, you know, sort of, Prior to about, and this is across the, 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 the lifespan, up to about the age of 25, people are processing emotional cues in the front part of their brain. Literally, they're cranking it out. You know, what is this person's picture of this person smiling, smiling about? You know, what does it mean? Whereas from about 25 onwards, it seems to be automated and put downstairs. And people can process it kind of without having to invest very heavily in conscious um, uh, cognition. Um, and that's a consequence, we think, probably of, of, of this kind of experiential component. So my worry would be child families, which are much more common now than they used to be. You know, you might not have, not developing the kinds of social skills and so on that, that inhibition uh, gives you in a way that you might have done. Uh, you know, particularly that's obviously school is a particularly important environment for, for children uh, for learning those kind of things, but if they're having to home, home, uh, te or home teach a lot or home learn a lot, then they're not getting that exposure. And adults are no good. You have to learn it from the other kids in the sandpit, literally in the sandpit of life, as they say, because the big difference there, you can't do it online because the, if, you know, the online social world, you can just switch off or switch somebody off if you don't like them. <laughs> the big thing about the face-to-face -face world and the sandpit of life is when somebody kicks sand in your face, metaphorically or literally, you can't get out of the sandpit. You just have to learn ways to cope with it. And that learning how to cope with those kind of social uh, situations is really crucial in learning the skills you need to handle the adult world, I think. And that, my worry would be that generation. But I think we have to worry about that generation just from the amount of time they spend online rather than out there in the sandpit. Anyway, I'm not sure, I'm not sure we'll see a big blip uh, from the effects of lockdown. So, so your main concern is the over 65? I, I, I think it's people my age. <laughs> really. Well, um, uh, how are you fixed for time? Because we have one hand raised. Shall okay. we go for the last one? One, one last question. One last yeah. question. Paul, um, unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. I was going to ask that last question. So uh, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. But can you give the question to somebody else? Because I was going to talk about that. So. Um, I, have, uh, I have checked and there are no other hands uh, raised. And I think it'll be unfair to... Uh, because there are loads of other questions that 
uh, that remain. Okay. But uh, I, okay, what know. what I would say then is, do you have any thoughts about the the abuses online that are occurring in social media and uh, you know the numbers of friends? Is this because of anonymity and uh, so on and so forth in these larger groups? What, what do you think? Um, I, I, I mean, I'm, yes, I mean, uh, you know, it, the the digital uh, social media, you know, have clearly been a, a very interesting experiment. In the, but in the, in one sense, they're just an alternative way of um, uh, being in a social world with with uh, meeting new people, maybe, but also you know, contacting your friends. And this is very clear if you look at Facebook postings, for example, or any other kind of social media postings. You, the time you spend talking to people who are already your friends in the offline world. Um, but, you know, the, it, it, the difficulty is, I suspect, is that you have an opportunity for social voyeurs to peer in from the outside, which isn't so dramatically present in the real offline world. Uh, what I think is very instructive in this context is online romantic scamming. And what I understand from the people who work in this area um, it, it, it really makes me think that this is this whole process of building romantic relationships shares many similar properties to the way we form friendships. It's a, they're all forms of courtship. We meet somebody, we think they're interesting. Some of them we think might be interesting as romantic partners, but others we, you know, it's just friends, platonic friends, or, you know, they, people we go and play football with or whatever it may be on a Saturday. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, the process that we go through a, a very similar to courtship in that respect. Now, essentially what that involves is creating an avatar in your mind of who that person is. You have all these cues that they give you, the things they say, the clothes they wear, whatever it is, how they speak and all these kind of things. Um, you get a sense of their personality, their background, the, the social community they come from, whether they'll match you on, on the seven pillars, do they like the same kinds of jokes, all these kind of things. So we build this avatar in our mind, but the fortunate thing about the face-to-face -face world is that from time to time it gets ground truth <laughs> because they don't they let you down badly <laughs> and that's this is true then of romantic relationships as, as it is of, uh, of friendships uh, but obviously it's more acute in the context of romantic relationships because it has more serious consequences because the relationship is built much more on trust in that sense so um but but one of the characteristics of that is we're very very tolerant with those kind of close relationships. And this applies to family relationships and very close friendships and rental partners. They're extremely tolerant of breaches of trust, small breaches of trust. And, and so whereas a friend do that, you just wouldn't bother to see them and the relationship would naturally decay. With those family and close emotional intimate relationships, you tolerate it and you tolerate it and tolerate it until they do it once too often and then it's a catastrophic breakdown and it's irreparable. You know, the only place it, it, that the rift gets healed is, is on deathbed reunions, uh, pretty much. And we see that in, if you look at pe people's relationship breakdowns, that's the picture you get from it. Now, I think this, this what's happening in, in romantic scams on the internet is the scammers are just exploiting that. They know how that works uh, intuitively, and they're very careful not to allow you to ground truth it. So they won't send, and, and, and the response comes back, Oh, well, they were so nice and they were so apologetic, you know, because you can't divorce reality in your head in these cases. Once you're so deeply mired in relationship, you can't uh, uh, um, uh, see reality adequately. And, I, you know, that's there for a purpose in normal relationships in that you have to be able to switch off your critical faculties in order to be able to step off the fence and initiate the relationship because otherwise you spend your life in a will she won't she kind of dilemma and never actually kind of tap them on the shoulder and say you know do you want to be have come have a coffee or do you want to be my friend or you know whatever uh, it is that, that you have to have this and this is and you can see this actually happening in the brain the brain shuts down um, it's literally is shut down in, at the initial stages of romantic relationships in particular uh, and you know okay that gradually fades no doubt with time but it seems to be very important to getting all kinds of relationships going to overcome this this initial barrier of 
fear of rejection because you don't want to make an opening bid as it were and then be turned down flat so, so that, that that scamming exploits that and allows it to just build and build and build and build so i think that that's one area where the digital world has played as a blind a, a, a card really i'm afraid but, Thank you very much. We'll need to bring this to a close. We've really imposed on your time, Robin, and thank you so much for, you know, supporting uh, the um, um, activities of both uh, the, uh, the Royal College uh, Evolutionary Psychiatry and now the WPA uh, Evolutionary Psychiatry. Uh, my, um, uh, my suggestion to other, uh, you know, attendants, read Robin's book, get hold of it. And uh, it's a great read, uh, really, really nicely written and summarizes a ton of a ton more data than what we heard today. Uh, and really, really good. So thank you very much again, Robin. Uh, and um, 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 thank you very much. A pleasure. Great. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And um, the session is now closed. Very good.